So today officially is a codicy, but fasting is done tomorrow. So today is the codicy day. But because of certain astrological uh, arrangements, they have determined fasting is on tomorrow. But today is the codicy day. Anyway. Okay, so. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, Canto 2, Chapter 3, Pure Devotional Service, Text Number 10. So, from t text 2 to text 9, it's the same theme, worshipping the demigods for various types of material uh, powers, benedictions, facilities. Now, this verse culminates the whole section by giving the, the understanding of the previous verses. <laughs> Moksha kama udaradi Tivrena bhakti yogena Adhyajaita purusham param Akama sarva kamo va Moksha kama udaradi Tivrena bhakti yogena Yajeta Purusham Param Akama Sarva Kamo Va Moksha Kama Udaradi Tivrena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham Param Chant. <laughs> Sadhakam, Oksha Kamo, 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 Sadh
Kama Sarva Kama Uva The emphasis for the holding is only done on the second and fourth line and not on any other part of the mantra. So if you say akamaha, that's wrong. It's akama. And if you say dihi, then it's right. Because it's only the second and fourth line that these emphases are given. Because actually, the uh, Sanskrit is only two lines. So we're getting two verses into one, really. <clears throat> okay, that's just a matter of uh, Sanskrit pronunciation. Akama, one who has transcended all material desires. Sarvakama, one who has the sum total of material desires. Va, either. Mokshakama, one who desires liberation. Udadadihi, with broader intelligence. Tivrena, with great force. Bhakti Yogena, by devotional service to the Lord. Yajeta, should worship Purusam, the Lord, Param, the Supreme Whole. Translation, a person who has broader intelligence, whether he be full of all material desires, without any material desire or desiring liberation, must by all means worship the Supreme Whole, the Personality of Godhead. Mm -hmm. Purport. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, is described in the Bhagavad Gita as Purushottama, <clears throat> or the Supreme Personality. <clears throat> it is he only who can award liberation to the impersonalist by absorbing such aspirants in the Brahma Jodi, the bodily rays of the Lord. The Brahma Jodi is not separate from the Lord, as the glowing sun rays is not in the planet of the sun disk. Therefore, one who desires to merge into the supreme impersonal Brahma Jyoti must also worship the Lord by Bhakti Yoga, as recommended here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhakti Yoga is especially stressed here as a means for all perfection. In the previous chapters, it has been stated that Bhakti Yoga is the ultimate goal of both Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga, and in the same way, in this chapter, it is emphatically declared that bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal of the different varieties of worship of the different demigods. Bhakti yoga thus being the supreme means of self-realization is recommended here. Everyone must therefore seriously take up the methods of bhakti yoga, even though one aspires for material enjoyment or liberation from material bondage. Akama is one who has no material desire. A living being naturally being part and parcel of the supreme whole, Purusham Puran, Puram, has, a na has his natural function to serve the supreme being, just as the parts and parcels of the body or the limbs of the body are naturally meant to serve the complete body. Desireless means, therefore, not to be inert like the stone, but to can't be conscious of one's actual position and thus desire satisfaction of the Lord alone. Sri Jiva Goswami has explained this desirelessness as Vajaniya Paramam Purush Purusha Sukhamatra Sam Sukhatvam in his Sandarbha. This means that one should feel happy only by experiencing the happiness of the Supreme Lord. This intuition of the living being is sometimes manifested even during the conditional state of the living being in the material world such as 
intuition is expressed in the manner of altruism, philosophy, socialism, communism, etc., by the undeveloped minds of the less intelligent persons. In the mundane field, such an outlook of doing good to others in the form of society, community, family, country, or humanity is a partial, manifest, partial manifestation of the supreme original feeling in which the pure living entity feels happiness by the happiness of the Supreme Lord. Such superb feelings were exhibited by the damsels of Rajabhumi for the happiness of the Lord. The gopis loved the Lord without any return, and this is the perfect exhibition of the Akama spirit. Kama spirit, or the desire for one's own satisfaction, is fully exhibited in the material world, whereas the spirit of Akama is fully exhibited in the spiritual world. Thoughts of becoming one with the Lord or being merged into the Brahma Jyoti, Jama Brahma Jyoti can be exhibitions of the Kama spirit if they are desires for one's own satisfaction to be free from the material miseries. A pure devotee does not want liberation so he can be relieved from his miseries of life. Even without so-called liberation, a pure devotee is, is, is aspirant for the satisfaction of the Lord. Influenced by the Kama spirit, Arjuna declined to fight in the Kurukshetra battle because he wanted to save his relatives for his own satisfaction. But being a pure devotee, he agreed to fight on the instructions of the Lord because he came to his senses and realized that satisfaction at the Lord at the cost of his own satisfaction was his prime duty. Thus he became a Kama. That is the perfect stage of a perfect living being. Udadadiya means one who has broader outlook. People with desires for material enjoyment worship small demigods, and such intelligence is condemned in the Bhagavad Gita as Rita Gyan, the intelligence of one who has lost his senses. One cannot obtain any result from demigods without getting sanction from the Lord. Therefore, a person with broader outlook can see that the ultimate authority is the Lord, even for material benefits. Under the circumstance, one with a broader outlook, even with the desire for material enjoyment or for liberation, should take up the worship of the Lord directly. And one whether, and whether, I'm sorry, and everyone, whether a kama, sarva kama, moksha kama, should worship the Lord with great expedience. This implies that bhakti yoga may be perfectly administered without the mixture of karma and gyan. As the unmixed sunrise is very forceful, there is therefore called tivra. Similarly, unmixed bhakti yogena and bhakti yoga for hearing and chanting may be performed by one and all regardless of the inner motive. Om gyan timirandasya gyana jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurveda maha Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Pasyat Yade Sitarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasiri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, the difference between material and spiritual is one acts for them, acts on behalf of their own interest, and the and and the other one, another person acts acts on the behalf of the Lord. So, one who tries to satisfy the Lord, that's the spiritual. And one who tries to satisfy themselves, that's material. That's the basic difference. So even in Bhakti Yogena, it says even if you have material desires, then if, just try to satisfy the Lord, and then everything will be satisfied. Here it mentions the Lord is the complete whole. You'll see it in the translation. It says here, by all means, one should worship the supreme whole, the personality of Godhead. That means everything's included within the whole. When you say something is whole, that means it's, it's complete. There's nothing outside of it. So Krishna is the supreme whole, 
and therefore even the demigods or all aspects of existence or even the unmanifested forms of existence, manifested and unmanifested, are part of the, the supreme whole. So this verse is basically saying, doesn't matter what your desires are, just worship God. <laughs> It doesn't really matter because if you try to follow, satisfy your desires independently, then you may get something, but you may not get the, the satisfaction you're looking from the satisfaction of the desires. In other words, you might not find the happiness you're looking for. And that's usually the case because material desires cannot bring real happiness. They can bring temporary relief from some suffering. But then again, due to their, what we say, temporary nature, they again leave, and then people continue to try to fulfill material desires endlessly. But one who satisfies the Lord automatically becomes satisfied. As one who waters the root of the tree or puts root food in the stomach, then everything that's connected with the root, the stomach, becomes nourished by that. There's a nice verse. Prabhupada quotes it very much. I think it's in the third canto. And it uh, describes these two analogies that simply by going to the essence, everything connected to the essence also becomes benefited. So if people could understand this, there wouldn't be no problems in life. That my interests simply center around me trying to satisfy God. Whatever it is, doesn't matter what the interest, that's what this verse is basically saying. Even if you have all material desires, if you're full of material desires, or if you have somehow become free from material desires, but you're not worshiping the Lord, and those who want liberation, freedom from material sufferings, it includes all three aspects of consciousness of the living entities in the material world, then just worship Krishna. That's all. It becomes that easy. But of course... We find that people don't understand how God works, and therefore they think, well, God is there simply through to, to satisfy my material desires. So let me try to, to satisfy my material desires and at the same time pray to God for his sanction, for his blessings. This goes on in the name of religion or some kind of practice of spirituality. A real, real devotion, a real religion, we might say, real religion, is simply, you know, to satisfy the Supreme Lord. And one who tries to make that effort in everything they do becomes very dear to the Lord and connected with the Lord. And then whatever you desire will automatically be fulfilled. As we mentioned in the previous class, there's two ways to fulfill material desires. One is that you get what you desire. Two, is that you get something better and you lose that desire. And that's Krishna consciousness. We see, sometimes we see devotees. They begin Krishna consciousness. They're working in the material world. They have many activities. In the material world, they take up Krishna consciousness seriously. They start chanting, associating, reading the books, doing some service. What happens is naturally they start losing their attraction for their material activities. And then they feel really confused. They still have the material duties, but they don't have the material taste anymore. I mean, we hear it all the time. The devotees say, well, you know, since I've been practicing Krishna consciousness, I, I don't really want to go to work anymore. <laughs> but I have to go because I need some, you know, some remuneration to live. But I don't, I'm not looking forward to going to work anymore. In fact, it becomes quite disgusting. <laughs> or even associating with materialistic people anymore. I, I actually, after associating with devotees, I find like being in, in associated materialistic people with the people has become a source of unhappiness for me. So this is what happens when you practice bhakti yoga, is that all these taste, well, these what is called ruchi, the word ruchi means taste, the material taste starts to turn into what they actually are. And they start to reveal that there's no real juice here. You know, just like we used to go to school when we were kids and we would 
sit in the classrooms. And one of the habits of kids, I guess they still do it today, is they take the chewing gum that they're chewing and stick it on the bottom of the desk, right? I don't know if they do it in your country, but in America, you could look under any desk in any school and you'd find a whole gamut of bubble gum, different colors there. So if you look underneath the desk and you think, oh, wow, there's a green one and there's a red one, maybe, a, you know, that one, that one looks really good. And you pick it up and you start chewing it, you're going to get nothing. <clears throat> but you're chewing. The activity is, is the same. But there's no juice. That's material life. He's just chewing to chew. There's nothing there. But Krishna consciousness is so satisfying that by making an effort to please the Lord, even if you don't perfectly please the Lord, if you try to please the Lord, that is pleasing to the Lord. Why? Because we may not be, be expert at that. That expertise in pleasing the Lord comes as one starts to practice devotional service regularly and very seriously. Then they learn how the Lord is pleased, and then they also start to uh, practice the mood or the consciousness of offering everything they do to the Lord. And that comes with practice and a little bit of what we say, experimenting with the way we perform our devotional service. When we start doing that regularly, we start to, we start to feel satisfied. It doesn't matter. Just like, what are we doing now? We're here. We're on a somewhat of a restricted lifestyle. And so what are the devotees doing? They're doing everything they did before, smaller group. But now we're spending so much time just fixing up the temple, cleaning the temple, uh, removing things that are not needed. It becomes blissful, right? Just to clean. In fact, cleanliness is such a high standard in devotional service that simply by practicing cleanliness, one be pleases the Lord automatically because it's the one of the highest forms of Brahminical quality. And our society is geared towards teaching people how to be clean in everything we do. And so this cleanliness principle actually exhibits bhakti in the form of pleasing the Lord by keeping everything clean, especially the Lord's temple. And so this is, uh, this is a high principle of devotional service, cleanliness. So we're doing that. We're just cleaning, cleaning this, cleaning that, cleaning that, cleaning that. It's, it's actually become so enjoyable, just cleaning the Lord's temple. And as Prabhupada said, every part of the temple is the body of the Lord, not just the temple room. Sometimes we say temple, we think just the area where we worship. But even the outside, that's also the temple. And so when you clean that, you're still cleaning Krishna's body. The whole temple is included. Your own area where you live, that's also important. Everything, super clean. So that's one of the principles of pleasing Krishna. But the, the principle here in general, which is being emphasized here, is that it doesn't matter what your position is. In. Here, even those who worship the impersonal Brahman for liberation, if they do it in relationship to pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they stay within the context of the Absolute Truth because of Vedanti tat tat vad vidvyams tad gyanam avyayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan eti subjite that the Absolute Truth is of, of three Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. And by jnana yoga, you reach Brahman realization. By astanga yoga, you reach paramatma realization. And by bhakti yoga, you reach uh, Bhagavan realization. So all of these three are one, but divided into three aspects of itself. Just like you might say, well, here's a house. So when you say, well, uh, someone says, are you in the house? Yeah, I'm in the house. But what room in the house are you? So the room indicates the different divisions of the absolute truth, but the house indicates the whole, the whole absolute truth. 
So sometimes you say, I'm in the house. Well, yes, that means you're in the house, but what part of the house are you in? When you get very specific. So Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan are all part of the same one house, but divided into three aspects of itself for different levels of realization of the absolute truth. And the higher you go, the one that you go higher to includes the one that's lower. So when you reach Bhagavan realization, Bhakti Yoga, then you're including in Brahman realization and Paramatma realization also. So those who worship the Lord in order to attain Brahma, Brahman realization actually will benefit and receive Brahman realization, but then they'll get a higher taste because they've actually connected with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And their Brahman realization will lead them to a higher realization. Just like the four Kumaras, we have the four Kumaras, they were Brahmavadis. They had realized the Brahman realization. But when they came to the area of Vaikuntha and they smelled, it was just a, a fragrance of the sandalwood paste and tulsi leaves that were offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, that aroma itself brought them to Bhagavan realization. Simply by coming in contact with the Lord's lotus feet through the aroma emanating from the Lord's lotus feet. Brahma bodies. They were not Maya bodies, but they were Brahma bodies. Brahma bodies means they're not envious of the Lord. They understand that the highest aspect of God realization is Brahman realization. But if something comes to them that's higher, they'll give up the lower and go to the higher. A Mayavadi will accept Brahman realization as the highest and will refuse to accept any other aspect of the absolute truth as being higher. And therefore, they're envious of the personality of Godhead and they can't make any advancement. And then, of course, as Lord Brahma says, Aruna Krishna Padam Padam Padantiyada, again, they fall down into the material world to take up materialistic activities like that. But devotees, um, we are neither of these three, akama, sarva karma, or moksha karma. We have our, we are akama in the sense that we we don't have to. We're not trying to fulfill material desires. We're trying to fulfill Krishna's desires, and this is real bhakti. As Prabhupada gives the example, many religions, whether they whether they teach, they teach their followers, oh, you pray to God to receive what you want in life. And God becomes the, the prayer becomes the currency by what you purchase your desire for. So it's motivated by personal. So in the, in one prayer, in the Christian tradition, they say, my dear Lord, please give me my daily bread. But Prabhupada goes on to say, we don't ask God for bread. We say, Lord, what would you like to eat today? We're not asking about what we like to eat. We ask God, what would you like to eat? And then we come up with some understanding and then we try to satisfy the Lord in that way. So this is, this is real devotion. And this is real life, actually. When one tries to satisfy the Lord, not thinking how to become satisfied oneself, one will receive everything they need and more. Because it's a two-way street. And Prabhupada said, what can you do with, to Krishna with two hands that he can give you with ten? In other words, you're trying to serve. You have two hands. What can you offer to him? He has ten hands in the sense that represents the ten directions. And he can give you everything and more. So there's no competition between who wins. Sometimes we say the devotee and the Lord has a competition. Who can serve the most? And the devotee tries to serve the Lord, and the, the, the Lord tries to serve the devotee. The Lord always wins. He's always better at serving. So that's, that's Krishna's mercy. And the opposite is also true. What can you hold on with two hands that the Lord is taking with ten? There's nothing in this world you can hold on to. You can try, but after some time you lose it anyway by the force of time. 
So, yeah, so a devotee is always thinking, what will please the Lord? How to please the Lord? So, what pleases the Lord most? Of course, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti Yoga is what pleases me. In other words, you offer everything with devotion. That is pleasure. But then Prabhupada goes on to refine it a little bit more in terms of the activities of devotional service. He says, the Lord comes to this material world many times to spread the glories of his own nature to the whole world so people will worship him. So when Krishna comes, what happens? Krishna consciousness becomes more and more stronger in the world. When Krishna came, practically the whole world was Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya, when he was here, he made the whole subcontinent in India Krishna conscious. So, but when the Lord goes, then of course material energy becomes again stronger and more prominent. So, but what is that service that pleases the Lord the most? Is there a service that's better than any other service? Prabhupada says says two things. He says, ultimately all services are equal because Krishna doesn't really need anything. But one thing he wants is that he wants everyone to become Krishna conscious. He wants everyone to love him. So those who assist him in bringing his mercy to others become especially dear to the Lord. So we call that preaching sometimes or teaching or in other words, putting oneself in a position to, to think, what, how can I give Krishna consciousness to everyone I come in contact with in one form or another? Especially in this time, if we find that because of the, the present, what we say, calamities going on in the form of this, this virus, and another calamity is the lockdown. People don't want to be locked down. They're locked down. <laughs> And so these double calamities, you know, the virus and the lockdown, people are more open to learn, you know, how can they get relief from this or how can they, you know, somehow or other change their life for the better. So to preach Krishna consciousness now is a really prime time because people are more open. Yeah, we're hearing that. We're, I'm getting reports from devotees all around different places about how it becomes now easier to talk to people. People are more inquisitive spiritually like that. Of course, here we are in the temple, so we can only do what we can in this, what we say, cyberspace program we have. But still, for those of you, after some time, when we begin become more mobile, then we can find more, continue to, See to think of different ways to uh, reach others with this mercy. Okay, so these are some of the points we can think of. So, this the this verse is a culmination of the the last ten verses, which are basically saying that forget about whatever your desires are, just worship Krishna, and everything will turn out exactly what you want and better. <laughs> In other words. All your material desires will be fulfilled. Your desire for liberation will be fulfilled. And you'll get even something better. You'll get eternal life in the spiritual world. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Yes, Mark and Dea. <clears throat> from Bhakta Milan. How come that Arjuna was not able to recognize Krishna even though Krishna was right next to him? That is the question. Well, initially, because he was overwhelmed with material attachments, he couldn't understand Krishna's position. But later on, he says, "Param Dhamma, Param Brahma, Pavitram Midam Uttamam, Avyaksavam Tama Dharmam Susukam." No, wait a minute. Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, 
What is the rest of that verse? Param Brahma, Param Dhamma. Paramam Bhavam. Yeah. So you are the supreme. You are the original, the eternal. He starts glorifying Krishna as the supreme person. And that's in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So initially, Krishna had asked him to fight, but he was not able to accept that because of his material attachments. Well, what was his material attachments? He became sentimental rather than philosophical. And his sentiment overruled his, uh, his intelligence. As Krishna told him, asocham anbasocham stwa, patyavaram shchibasa say, katasum sakudatsum scha nanu shochanti panditaha. After Arjun gave so many reasons for wanting, uh, for showing that there's no use to fight, you know, this is not going to work out. We're going to kill our, you know, our superiors who are the foundation for this society. Uh, we're going to kill the men and the men or the women are going to be, what we say, without any protection. And then Varna Sankara will come. Uh, he gives so many reasons. He said, even if we win the battle, how can we enjoy at the expense of the lives of those we worship. So he gives so many reasons, and after Krishna says, very nice reasons, but you're a fool. <laughs> Krishna told him directly, you're a fool. Why? Because you you think you know what's right, but it's actually you don't. <laughs> if a person admits, I don't know, that's a sign of intelligence. But a person pretends they know, but really doesn't know, just to make a show or to convince themselves they know, that's a fool. And so Krishna chastised Arjuna because he was speaking nice words, but he was not able to understand the situation properly. So, yeah, but he knew Krishna was superior to him, Arjuna has a friendship relationship with Krishna. He's Krishna's eternal friend. In fact, many times where Krishna appears, Arjuna also appears, not only in this particular Leela, but in other places. So, because of his being, what we say, bewildered by material desires, he couldn't recognize that the Supreme Lord was standing in front of him. But after some time, when he he said that one, when he spoke that one statement. In essence, Prabhupada says he's, they're having discussion. So Krishna is saying something, Arjuna is saying something. They're going back and forth. They're disagreeing. Then Arjuna realizes that hmm, we're not getting anywhere. So let me take you as my spiritual master, and let me become your disciple. Then I can learn. So that comes in the second chapter, just before Arjuna, Krishna actually ch uh, chastised him. He says, you know, let me become your disciple. This, 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 all, this equal talks are not getting anywhere. I have to learn from you. So he starts to understand Krishna is in a superior position all the way through. But finally he, become, he realizes Krishna as the supreme. That comes out a little later. But before then, he knew it also, but he just became bewildered. So the answer is, by being bewildered by material desires, even if God sometimes walks in front of you, you won't recognize him. Just like it says that when Krishna was on the planet, he came in contact with millions of people but how many actually knew he was the Supreme Lord? It says between 100 and 200 knew he was, he was actually the Supreme God, although he came in contact with millions. So that's what material desires do. They, they block 
your ability to relate to the Lord, to understand the Lord, to accept the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Bhagatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.